This is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Wednesday, October 28th, 2015, and I'm interviewing Marlene Writing in Mamia for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project at the Oklahoma State University Oral History Research Program. We are at Marlene's home in Pawnee. Marlene, you are Pawnee. You're one of the first Native women in Oklahoma to make German silver jewelry and your art has been worn by champion powwow dancers and from all over. You also do finger weaving. You've shown at the Southern Plains Indian Museum and were the honored one at the Red Earth Indian Arts Festival in 2007. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born on the home place which is located um, south of Yale, next to the Cimarron River. Pretty so early. I always say I was born on the Cimarron River. <laughs> <laughs> what did your uh, mother and father do for a living? What? What did your mother and father do for a living? And my father was a farmer, and my mother was a housewife. Brothers or sisters? I had... Um, Three brothers and two sisters. Where did you fall in the, in the sequence? Where did you come in? I was a baby. How about your grandparents um, on either side of the family? What was your relationship with them? I didn't know my grandfather on my father's side, but I knew my well, I didn't know my grandmother either, but I knew my great-grandmother on my father's side. And on my mother's side, I knew, well, my grandmother and my grandfather was actually my step-grandfather. But I didn't know that until I was 30 years old. When he died, they told me he wasn't my grandfather, and I didn't know that. And uh, that, that, they were the only ones that I knew growing up that I had grandparents. Were you around the language a lot growing up? <laughs> yes, because my grandparents, they, were, they didn't know how to talk Pawnee. But I wasn't around them enough. They lived up here and we lived down at the, around Yale. Mm -hmm. So I would only see them on the weekends because we would come up here every weekend and uh, visit one, stay with one family one weekend, the next we would go to the other, stay with them. But I was never around them long enough to understand or know the language. And my father and my mother used to use the language to keep secrets from us, you know. <laughs> So we just never did learn. They never taught us, but we knew some words. You know, sit down and get up and behave, mostly behave. And just, you know, things like that. Right. Did you have any extended family members who were in, in, involved in the arts? I can't remember any. Do you remember? Do you claim uh, Caesar? Oh, this <laughs> this is Donna speaking. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. This is uh, I mean Julius Caesar. He okay. was my father's uh, nephew, and he was. A fantastic silversmith, or he, he called it a metalsmith. Right. So, um, did you see some of that work as okay. a young girl? Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, he was, you know, always around, and he he was really friendly, and he was always giving things away that he made, and he's always giving my mother earrings. So she had some of his work. Neat. What is your fi first memory of seeing Native art? 
My first memory, I imagine it was at Shalako when I went to school up there. Um, cause that, that's the only time I was around art that I can remember. Well, going to school, you know, drawing pictures and all like that, but up there, uh, you got to see Indian art and so many things that I didn't know anything about. You know, other tribes. And I was in arts and crafts, and that's where I started. I started uh, with it drawing, so the teacher knew that I had the talent to draw. And that's when I, the first, or a, teacher was, uh, what's her name? I can't think of her name now. But she was from out west. I don't think she was Navajo. She was something else. But she was a teacher up there, and she did um, weaving on the boards, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, not the loom work. But it was just a board, mm -hmm. yeah, and it, she taught me that. And then the rug, rag rug weaving, we did those. And she noticed I had an aptitude for that. So she started me on the loom. And I used to weave uh, Afghans and tablecloths, napkins, and the school would sell them. You know, they would have them there for sale for people that came in. So that's where I learned to do weaving. And then when Mrs. Wapp came, well, she taught me the finger weave. So that's where I got my start, and that's when I started. She encouraged me to paint, and I did. And that's where, um, oh, it was, uh, I think it was the dean, the president of Bacon College. He came up one year and he went to the art, I mean, the arts and crafts department. And he noticed what I had been doing on my artwork. So he got my name and address from Mrs. Webb. And she told me that he was real interested in, you know, me going to school down there. And they wrote me a letter, so I showed it to my father. And he always encouraged my artwork. He was the one that was always behind me. So that's why he sent me to back home. Now, when did you go to Shalako? How old were you when you went to Shalako? I went to Shalako, I think it was in 47 to uh, 49, then I went to Bacon for one year, then I started again, but then I quit. Oh. Um, what was it like at Bacon when you got to that program? That's why I went, went was for the Indian art, and uh, Dick West was the teacher. And I was just fascinated by all the Indian art. So when I got there, well, in the class, he made us all sit, sit around and uh, told us to draw something for him. Well, I drew a war dancer. And he walked around, he looked at everybody, and he pointed to me, and he said, you upstairs. So I went upstairs, and then he came up, and he showed me how to transfer. He wanted me to do what I was doing and to correct all the mistakes in it, showed me how to correct the mistakes, and to transfer it onto paper. So that was the start. And as I understand, he sent you upstairs because you were doing Indian art, and he saw the talent. The other students were just doing yeah. regular, some kind of regular assignment. Yeah, because I was... <laughs> Mostly Indian. I mean, right. everything was Indian to me. Right. 
I, I think I also read that you wanted to take jewelry making when you got I to Bay I did. When I found out they had that program, I wanted to take it, but they wouldn't let me because they didn't let women do it. Do you so, remember who was teaching the jewelry making class? Dick West. But he said it was, you know, it wasn't part of the program and that the school didn't want women taking that course. So I didn't get to take it. But I fooled him. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> and it, anyway, you got encouragement from him for painting, I guess. So is that what you continued to do at Bay Uh-huh. That was what... Um, I did, and I don't know, he just really took an interest in me because he thought that I had the talent to do it. And then uh, A.C. Blue Eagle lived in Muskogee, and he would come out to the school. And when he heard I was Pawnee, well, he knew my parents. He had met them, you know, and, and then... Uh, He'd heard that a Pawnee was going to school out there. So he came out, and then he, first thing he told me, he said, well, I know your parents. And anyway, he helped me, both of them. Well, Dick West took art from uh, A.C. Blue Eagle. That was his teacher. So it's kind of funny. I learned from both of them, and Ace was always bringing books out for me to read, to look at, and to copy, and he would make me uh, draw things that was in the books that pertained to Pawnee, and that way he said I'd have a record of everything, then I have to write down everything, you know. So he was a big help to me. And then I did the... Uh, they wanted me to enter that uh, art contest at Philbrook that year. Well, I didn't know what to paint, so A.C. brought a book out, and it's about Pawnees, and he said, read this book and take a picture out of this book and paint it and draw it. Well, I didn't know what I was doing, so I latched onto this morning star ceremony that they had in there, and, and mm -hmm. I had one little part there that I drew, and it was actually just a dance. Mm. And I finished it with their, you know, they're telling me how to paint and everything and mixing paint, how to use lines and how to, well, they didn't shade at all, it was flat, but there was a way you could uh, shade using different colors blending them kind of and they taught me that so they entered into Philbrook and it won first place in the Plains Division wow. so I was the youngest one to ever win there um, in all of the divisions because I was I think I was 17 I was 16 when I painted it Wow. And I was 17 when I entered it. Uh, my birthday was in March. I think the... I can't remember. I think it was in April was when that contest was. So anyway, after I won, I told my father about it. And he wanted to know what I painted. And I told him, and he got mad. Mm -hmm. He told me that that morning star ceremony was not part of the Pawnees. It was skeety. And he said, don't you ever paint anything about the morning star ceremony again. He said, if you want to know about Pawnees, he said, uh, you talk to me about it and I'll tell you, you want to know our ceremonies you know, the ones that pass and dances. He said, you, you just tell me and I'll tell you, I'll show you. So I did. After that, this painting over here is uh, the one that he did. He uh, wanted me to draw the doctor dance. 
and I, I did that in two weeks, and it should have taken a lot longer than that, but I was in a hurry. So it's not actually up to my standards. <laughs> I mean, it looks... It's beautiful, though, a lot of figures in there. Yeah, you know, well, Indian art in itself was not pretty. I mean, the faces were were ferocious, and, you know, they, were, they weren't... Uh, good-looking people that, that they painted and it was, it, I don't know, uh, the figures were a little different than what you would do nowadays and what I do now, it'd be a whole lot different. But Indian art was just flat, so you had to go with what you had, what you could. What but this one, uh, it went, it, I entered it at Philbrook, but it didn't win anything, but it took, um, they wanted it to go on a tour, and it was gone for a year or two, and I'd forgotten all about it. And then one day, uh, they delivered it to the house, and I didn't <laughs> know what it was until I opened it. You were back in Pawnee at that point? No, I was living in Sky Tooth. You were at Sky Tooth, okay. See, I was married and living in Sky Tooth. When I did this, I just went home. Okay. So that he would be there, you know, to tell me what to do and, and to okay it. So did you meet your husband at Bay Calm? Is that No. Okay. How did no. you get from Bay Calm to Sky Tooth? Well, I met my husband. Okay. <laughs> And um, got married, and that's, he lived in Sky too, so I went to Sky too. Were you thinking at that point you wanted to continue painting? Were you? Mm, I wanted to, but then again I didn't, I mean, um, I didn't have much interest in painting at that time. He was uh, trying to farm. He actually was the city, you know, grew up in the city, never had farmed or anything. And he was a veteran, and he was, his mother had the, some land out there that he wanted, that had a house, so he wanted to live there and try to farm. And being a farm girl, you know, it was right down my alley. <laughs> So I helped him, and my dad gave us a tractor. So we lived there, well, I forgot, until his father died. And when his father died, we moved into town to take care of his mother, or to stay with her. But I didn't do any artwork. I just did little pieces. Uh, when people found out that I could draw, they want me to do a painting of something, you know, for a certain thing, so I would do that. Then I got into ceramics, and then I did little uh, lamps uh, and <laughs> of Indians, you know, it was a decanter, really, and it was a real goofy-looking decanter, so I kind of shaved it off and, you know, took things off that I didn't like and painted them and made lamps out of them. So I used to sell those, and then uh, some somebody wanted me to start painting plates, you know, just to hang on the walls. So I did plates with a straight dancer and a, a buckskin dress that were in pairs. And that was about all the artwork that I did. Did you sell those to individuals, or did you, were you, did you sell to the uh, No, I sold to the people that ordered them. Mm -hmm. They would um, call me or come by the house and want you know want me to do different things and draw something for them or like uh, that painting over there that went on the uh, cover of a Pow Wow book. And I had another one out, but I never did get it back. Another Pow Wow book. Mm. How did you get involved uh, with Supernaz? I met my husband at a stomp dance, and that was it. 
<laughs> that was the beginning. <laughs> you were captured. <laughs> um, and then you went to work for the Super Nye Indian store, right? That was after my husband died. Oh, okay. Kagi uh, wanted to, well, actually, he hired me to draw um, patterns so that he could make the, you know, the object. Uh, for jewelry? Mm -hmm. Okay, for his jewelry. So I would draw like the earrings, and then he would cut them out and make them. And I didn't like that too well, but I started doing it myself. And he found out that I could work with metal. You were watching, is that how you learned from mm -hmm. watching him work? Yep. Okay. And then uh, after I started working, there well, he showed me how to use uh, different um, stamps or uh, tools that you use, and just basic information, you know, on how to do metal work. Mm -hmm. And then I, after I learned that, I just took off from there. And like these hair ties here, that's, that's, it's actually um, based on a beaded hair tie. Pam Chai Biddy broke, uh, had a lot of beads missing out of her hair tie. So she wanted me to replace the beads, because I did a lot of bead work too. And uh, when I was replacing the beads, I thought, well, why can't I make a hair tie out of these? So that's how that started. Oh, okay. <laughs> And so I just made my own patterns. And I was I worked there four years for him. And then I met my second husband. And he was actually my cousin's uh, nephew by marriage. She was married to his uncle. So when I married him, that made her, no, it made me her aunt, or no, her, my aunt. She was my aunt. That's who right. I was, and we were cousins. That was so crazy. <laughs> but then after I married Ace, well, he was uh, disabled. He had uh, rheumatoid arthritis real bad. And I continued by that time I was working on my own joy. And uh, he wanted to help me and he tried, but he couldn't, he couldn't cut out metal or he just didn't have it, you know. Mm -hmm. Some people can do it, some can't. But he could, he could finish. He did the polishing and all that to finish, you know, whatever I made, and that really helped me. I didn't have to do all the hard work. That's real time consuming, isn't it? Yeah. So. So were you selling mainly at powwows then mm -hmm. at that point? Okay. Yeah, and then we were invited to different uh, um, oh, what are they? Um, what do you call them? Conferences okay. and, uh, you know, those big gatherings like that. And then to tap powwows. So we would travel to right. sell. So we, we traveled all over the United States doing that. And that was a lot of fun. Where was the most, what was one of your most exciting travel adventures? What was what? What was one of your most exciting travel adventures? Maybe out of state travel. Oh gosh, I can't remember. <laughs> or just a place that you enjoyed going to that was out of state. Uh, going to Connecticut and seeing that river. I can't remember the name of it. To me, that was the biggest river I'd ever seen. And we crossed it going into White Plains, New York. And 
we were both afraid to go into New York City. <laughs> you know, all the traffic and everything. So we bypassed that and went around to White Plains, then cut across to go to Connecticut. But that, I think that was the best trip because it was, I'd never been up there and I'd always read about different things, and but that river to me was the most exciting. It was so big compared to the rivers that I'd seen, mm. and being born on a river, <laughs> next to the river rather. So, in terms of when you were first starting to show your work and you started off right away with German silver, is that right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain the difference between German silver and some of the other metals, regular silver? Well, the difference between, well, German silver is actually a nickel silver. And uh, I don't know why they call it German silver outside of when they first start bringing it over, it came from Germany. And they brought uh, things that were made for like uh, all, uh, uniforms, you know, the, the buttons mm -hmm. and gorge, gorges and all of those. And it fascinated the Indians and they wanted it. So they got to trading. They found out, um, the white people found out that the Indians wanted that, so that was a good trade product. They would take all the silver that, you know, they got from England and carry it with them, and, and the Indians would trade for it. Well, it, it worked its way down to uh, the plains. And when they found out that they could get the German silver, then they started making it. And sterling, it was too expensive, and it was too fine. It wouldn't last very long. Where this German silver would last forever. And worn, you know, when you wear it. But with uh, sterling, it wears. It'll wear out. And you explained that Navajo, some of the Navajo jewelers that you would show around had an attitude towards German silver. Oh, they didn't like German silver. They would say things about, laugh, you know, about German silver. So they'll come by our table and look at it and just kind of make a face and say something about it, you know. And like it was degrading. And I, I didn't like it because uh, they did that. And I avoided them. And that's why I never went to the Indian market. Mm. was because I was... The way that they had treated the German silver and talked about it. So I th just figured they didn't want it there and... So, I never tried to go, and I was invited to go there. And I just wouldn't do it because of that. And the one thing, I'm, I'm a traditionalist, so I stuck with it because I'm a Plains tribe. Mm -hmm. And Southern Plains is all I do. And, and you, I, I, I think ster, uh, sterling and turquoise should be, you know, that belongs to them. So that that's their type of work. I respect it, and I always wish that they could respect the planes. Mm -hmm. But they little did they know that they took a lot of our plane, our uh, planes um, patterns. Because the conchos actually came from the plains and different other, you know, articles. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, 
there were uh, planes, but we wore, mm -hmm. and they would copy them. And I think they're well known for copying anyway. You mentioned that you enjoy, um, mo you mostly sold to dancers. And um, I was wondering, how is the satis... It's a different kind of satisfaction, maybe, than selling to people who aren't at dancers. Can you talk about that a bit? Well, it didn't matter if he wanted to wear it. You know, what I made, that was good. I've had people come by and say they inherited stuff, and they were very proud of it. And uh, it, it just, whoever wanted to buy what I made, you know, it was good. I was glad. But I actually made uh, objects for dancers. And a lot of times, these little ones would come up and they'd be beginning dancing. And their, I knew their parents didn't have a whole lot of money to dress them. So I would give them, you know, little things to help them along. Mm. And they would be real happy. Just little kids, you know, just a pair of earrings, something like that, or armbands. And it just... That's what I made, and it, to me it was usable, and I see it now, to this day, I see people wearing them, you know, the articles that I've made. They're still using them, just like uh, Julius Caesar's work. Anybody that has his work should be very proud of it, because it's he made it, and it's been handed down all these years. And that's what my husband used to say. He said, this, this is going to last forever. Long after you're gone, he said, your tour is going to be around, it's going to be used. And that's good. Mm -hmm. What did you, um, what do you think distinguished your work from maybe other people who made things in German silver. Yeah, what? what made your work a little bit different, your German silver work, from maybe another jeweler that was working in German silver? What made it different? Well, Were there certain one thing, I made my own patterns. <laughs> I never copied because I could draw and make my own patterns, and I've seen a lot of my patterns being used <laughs> by other people. <laughs> After you came up with them. <laughs> but that's to be expected. <laughs> Did you enter any competitions with your jewelry? Uh, yeah. What's an important award that you got early on? One that you're proud of? Oh, probably uh, Red Earth. I've won there several times. And then the honored one, that was the biggest one. That is really special. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like when you found out about it? Well, when they called me, they asked me if I was sitting down. <laughs> I was working and I told her, yes, I'm sitting down. And she said, well, you are, you know, picked to be the honored one. And it didn't quite, you know, I thought she was kidding. I thought, you know, somebody's joking and I just laughed. And she said, no, no, it's really, you know, you really are. I said, you're kidding. No. And then it dawned on me, it really was, you know, and I, I just couldn't believe it, you know, me. <laughs> I knew I was old enough, <laughs> not like Merlin. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it was quite an honor it, uh, to know that they did pick me, to know that my, they enjoyed my artwork that much. And you wrote in the parade, right? 
you in the parade? You what? Were you in the parade? No, oh. I, uh, I was on a walker then, mm. and I couldn't get around too good, and it started raining, oh. so I got out of it. <laughs> How did you figure out how to price your work? Uh, actually, my work was underpriced according to everybody. They said I was cheap. Because they would say, oh, so-and-so's got this and they're, you know, that much higher. And, and I never tried to put a big price on anything because I was selling to the Indians. And I knew they didn't have a whole lot of money. So I tried to keep it down to where people could afford it. What was your favorite, one of your favorite things to make? Favorite thing? I don't know that I... The, or maybe a difficult thing to okay, make with German Okay, the difficult soap. one is what I was thinking. Uh, Gourget's. Mm. It, um, they were kind of fascinating to make. You know, they were big. Yes. And you had to figure out all your stamping, how to get it in, what pattern, how you could get your pattern worked in. And it, it, it was, it was kind of mind-boggling at times, but I managed. They really show it, yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, what is his name? He's a collector. I always called him Dr. Bell. Bell Williams. Bill Wiggins, is it? What? Bill Wiggins? Yeah, uh-huh. He's, uh, he's got this scrapbook full of everything he's collected through the years. And he's got like four full pages of my artwork in there, of things that he's bought from me. And I was surprised when he showed it to me that he had that many things, you know. I didn't, I knew he was collecting, but I didn't know he collected that much. And I know as soon as he'd come in, he'd come to the table and pick out the best thing I had, the newest thing, you know, then he'd buy it. I was going to ask you what uh, were some of the pieces that you won on? What, was the Gorget one of them? Or? Uh, one was a cross. It was a large cross, you know, to be worn, a man dancer. Mm -hmm. And um, it was cut out, a lot of cut out. It had to, on the four sides, it was cut out. Water birds were cut out on each mm -hmm. end, and I forgot what was in the middle. But that one was, I think, to me, it was the best thing I made. That was at Red Earth, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I remember that piece. Yeah, it was beautiful. Did uh, y you had a show at Southern Plains Indian Museum as well? Do you do you remember the year, approximately? Um, 2000 and 2001. Okay. What was that like? Actually, it was, I was, I mean, I, I, I wanted to go, but my husband was in a hospital at that time. Mm. And so I, I was I was staying up to Oklahoma City with him, and I didn't want to go, but he talked me into going. He said, "You have to go. You have to be there." And so I went reluctantly, and. Uh, it was it was good, but I was so worried about him that you know I couldn't enjoy it really. I wanted him there with me, and then um, 
But I was so glad when my niece and her mother showed up. You remember that? Um, at Ritter? Who's no, this? at uh, Southern Plains. Oh, yeah. Dark. Oh. Yeah, at Southern yeah, Plains. Then we all went to the hospital afterwards mm -hmm. to see him. They stopped by to see him. And uh, friends of mine had wired flowers. So they boxed them up and we took them up there to him. Oh. But it was a good show. A lot of people came, a lot of people bought. And they, they said that was the most productive show they had. Is that right? Best sales. Mm -hmm. Best sales show. Yes, he, he sounds like he was such a good supporter yeah. of your work. Was he sort of the salesperson at the booth, too? <laughs> he was. I used to say I was production and he was sales. <laughs> but you had to know him to know that he could sell. <laughs> I seen him, I seen a woman, she was standing way back, you know, all hunched up and just real shy. And she, he kept telling her, come to the table and look at our, you know, what we've got. And he kept talking to her and she finally, she came to the table and, I mean, he's talked to her and talked to her and it, it just seemed like she blossomed. She started laughing, and she straightened up, and she just, I could see the difference, you know, just with him talking to her like he did. So you just saw how that young woman just blossomed? Yes. It was, it was really something to see. I mean, that's the kind of person he was. Mm -hmm. He had make friends with anybody, talked to anybody. And, I don't know, everybody liked him. He was just a person like that. He couldn't dislike him. <laughs> um, how would you describe some of the changes at the Red Earth Indian Arts Festival over the years? Um, how the changes were at Red Earth during the years? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it started falling off. Uh, the dancers, people quit coming because you had to pay to get in and all they did was contest. They couldn't dance. So the people didn't come. It was just uh, people that wanted to buy. And it, it's, I don't know, that, that, that cut the parade down. You know, it wasn't as good as it used to be. And they didn't have as good of uh, oh, uh, advertising. Mm -hmm. It wasn't advertised like it had been. Things just start changing. People start dropping out. Mm -hmm. uh, might say some of the ones that could make a good show somewhere else, you know, they wouldn't come back to Red Earth. But all those locals were always there. <laughs> um, how about just in general on the Native art scene, what were some of the changes from like the 70s through the 80s? Because you were already selling in the 70s and traveling quite a bit. 70s to the 80s? Mm hmm See, so, well, that was some of the good years. The there probably weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of people doing your work. Oh, you mean my type of work? Mm-hmm. Well, there was Bruce. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we were the only two that did uh, German silver. The rest were all sterling and turquoise. It was just loaded with people from you know Arizona, and New Mexico. They had all that turquoise and all that. Stuff. They were coming out this way and mm -hmm. hitting a lot of the shows. More and more. Right. How about changes in the Native art scene from the 80s to the 90s? Just the whole art scene in general. 
was basically like the others, except it did start falling off. Um, seems like it. I don't know. There was so many good years. You know, I can't remember. I can't place the actual dates. Right, right. And as far as I was concerned, they were good years. But there was, you could tell a difference in the, the people. There wasn't as big a crowd as there used to be. And the, like I said, the dance part kept falling off. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of your audience. Yeah, some of your audience there. But we didn't, we didn't suffer for it because we sold just as much. And it was funny because this woman came by and uh, she looked at everything and it, she says, is this sterling? No, it's German silver or nickel silver. Oh, so she put it down and wandered off, you know. And then before the show was over, she came back and she bought three, four articles, you know. She said, they're selling them like this over there. They're not as good. But she said, they want a big price for them. And I said, well, that's sterling. You'd pay more. She said, I don't care. Yours is better looking. She said, and I'll, be, I'll buy this. It's cheaper. So we saw. <laughs> uh, you helped start a Pawnee Art? Artists Association or Pawnee Arts yeah, Association? Yeah, we had uh, so many Pawnee artists that there was uh, a banker and a uh, uh, Echo Hawk who was uh, an outstanding artist mm -hmm. and uh, Cecil Stern and he's a Pawnee businessman and Everett Berry was a banker so they were all friends and they're the ones that were backing it. They they got it started. It was one of them's idea, and they just run with it. <laughs> so they had a meeting, and invited everybody to go out, you know, to come out. So we went out to it, and a lot of us went to it, and, and that's how it started. Then we'd have meetings out to the roundhouse, and several times the roundhouse was closed, so we'd have the meetings outside the roundhouse. But then we we formed and people started joining. And the purpose of the Pony Arts was to get all the artists and we were going to teach the younger ones. We weren't getting paid for it or anything. So we all had certain things we were going to teach. Like Brummett came in and he, he taught uh, charcoal and he was going to teach um, uh, acting, give acting lessons, and um, I don't think anybody got into oils. And then um, I was down for jewelry making and uh, uh, yarn work, and somebody else made ribbon work, shawls, you know, just. Uh, different things that they made that they could teach younger ones or anyone that wanted to learn. And that's how the Pawnee Arts formed and, and we did really good. It's surprising, but we had good backers. So you had several workshops that, um, did, you, did you then do a metal work uh, workshop? Do what? Did you do a workshop in jewelry making and did you give one through the Pawnee Artists Association? Did you do the workshop in, in jewelry that you talked about? Did I do the artwork? Uh, the workshop. Oh yeah. Was that your first workshop that you'd ever done? Yeah. How did it go? Yeah, I. Uh, it went good. What did you learn? You learned mocks and making one. Um, 
Yeah, we did some moccasin making and uh, we Donna. did ribbon work. Ribbon work. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Buddy Lunchy, didn't he teach something too? Uh, yeah, drawing. he did sketching. You know Buddy? Charles Lunchy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I knew mm -hmm. you did if you were from Tulsa. Oh, this is Donna. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a mixture of uh, adults and younger people in your yes. class? Anybody. Uh huh. Anybody that wanted to learn. That's wonderful. We had a, a program from uh, uh, our association of uh, Oklahoma City. What was the name of uh, that? Oklahoma Arts Council? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had this grant. And we applied for it and it went through. It uh, concerned a master artist and they would teach one person. So I was a master artist and we had uh, Willie Beard was the one that I was to teach. And I mean he picked it up and nothing flat. He was really good. Oh, it didn't take long. But he was like that. He was really gifted. But he was an alcoholic so you couldn't depend on him. Mm. But all during the time that he was doing this, he was steady because mm -hmm. he was interested in it. I remember that grant. And then he, he did. He did everything that he was supposed to do. And when it was over, he, had, he could do real good work. But he, he had a talent. So that we, we did that. But that was the only time. The Pony Arts was kind of, after that, it, I quit. Mm -hmm. I was a president for about three terms, and oh. I, I did, well, I had, he was president the last time, then he just got off, you know, and, and didn't come back. So I had to take over because I was vice. So I stayed with it that year, but that was the last year. Mm -hmm. The next year, I didn't want to have that responsibility and then the woman that got in there she was brainless as far as uh, artwork so I just quit the organization mm -hmm. because of her is it still around today or no okay it lasted about two or three years later then it just faded away right now you have taught a, a, is it finger weaving is that what you taught most recently or weaving Finger weaving? Mm hmm A couple of years ago? Um, no, I taught that with the class. That was with the Pony Arts. Arts. Okay, okay. And I've been trying to teach my nieces, but they haven't caught on yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to try again here. <laughs> Mine was way too loose. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your technique just a little bit more. Um, when when you order um, your German silver to work with, how how does it come? What what form does it come in? Um, well, you can order up to thirty six inches by twelve. I just have them cut it in twelve by twelves. Okay. I could handle it better. They're sheets of twelve by unless 12. it was like armbands, and I would specify the length and the width, mm -hmm. and they would cut. It. Mm -hmm. That way, I didn't have to saw it. Um, can you take us through the process of, like, let's say, making an armband? Well, like I just said, I had the armbands cut because right. I didn't want to use a saw. Oh, you had the width and the length cut um, already. Okay, okay. So it's maybe kind of hard to saw. Yeah. So take us through some earrings, maybe making a pair of earrings. Just talking us through how you would make a pair of earrings. Well, first you draw your pattern and uh, transfer it onto the metal. And I used to scratch it in. Okay. Because with uh, carbon or anything else, it would, you know, smear and you'd lose your pattern. So after I transferred the pattern, I would scratch it on and then file, uh, saw it with a jeweler saw and cut it out. 
Then you file it. Get all the rough edges, get it straight, and uh, bevel it. And then you would stamp it. Then after you stamped it, you would, if you wanted it curved, you would curve it. You know, you'd put it on a round piece of metal and kind of pound it to where it would curve. And uh, otherwise, you could lay it flat like an earring. Oh, you would hammer it. Now, I used to hammer the back of mine. A lot of them didn't. But I would hammer mine because when I stamped, I kind of stamped deep. It wasn't just on the surface, of, you know. Mm. I was heavy-handed, I guess. But uh, then I would turn it over and hammer it on the back. A lot of them didn't like that because they said it marred the surface. But after you buff it, it takes any marks out or anything. Mm. It takes the scratches out. And then uh, you buff it and that's it. Did you ever use stones with your in combination? Yeah. Um, what did you like in terms of stones? It would be uh, black onyx. I worked mostly yeah, in black onyx. That looks good with the... We'll look at a piece here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a red... Uh, what was it? Karma, karma white. I forgot the names of the stones now. It's been so long. But it would be a red stone. It wouldn't be mm -hmm. onyx. Mm -hmm. be a, I mean, it wouldn't be a... No, I forgot the name. But what's that? The red one. Oh, coral? Coral. No. Oh, coral. Oh, red coral. coral. Okay. It would be more of a, a metal, I mean, a stone from... Mm -hmm. Not from the southwest. <laughs> right. <laughs> what, what is your creative process, like, from the time you get an idea? for a piece of jewelry. How long would it take? Or or how does it work? Do you get an idea and maybe draw it in a notebook? How, how yeah. What is your creative process? Yeah, I would draw it in a notebook. I've got notebooks around here with oh. all patterns, you know, drawn out. And then I would be drawing up here, you know, late at night or something if I was watching TV and then I'd go back there and transfer it, get it all straightened out the way I wanted it. Then I would work on it. So it was always just a hit and miss. <laughs> and did you like to work better at night or? Yes. I would work till like two and three o'clock in the morning. Then my husband would let me sleep in and he'd He'd buff in the mornings. I wouldn't even hear him. I'd be sound asleep. And he'd take whatever I've made and he'd buff it and finish it all up so that all it needed was to be carded. So we, we, we weren't good together like that. And we were always ready for another show. We went to one. We had to go like once a month because we'd sell out. And then we'd have to restock, and it would take us for, you know, the rest of the month to do that till the next show. But how, how many pieces would you try to have, typically? How many pieces? How many pieces? Gosh, I don't know. Like, uh, about six sets of those long earrings. Wow. And, uh, six, uh, hands. And brooches, about three pair of them. A couple of armbands, roach spreaders. Right. And just, you know, a variety of everything. But the earrings is what we did the most of. Mm -hmm. And we do, I did a lot of circles. Like she's got, do you have the circles on? I, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like great. Right. We'll, we'll and they were different sizes. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were long. I think she had some of the longer ones there. Oh, the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I showed her these. These? 
or the other no. ones, the circles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, circles. yeah, they're in my bag. Yeah, well, we'll mm-hmm. we'll look at those okay. in a minute. We'll pause mm-hmm. them. Uh, I sold a lot of those. This, they were they were more inexpensive than mm-hmm. those uh, birds, like the water birds. Mm-hmm. Those were more expensive because they were harder to make. There's more pieces to them. And in terms of designs, and your, um, did you sometimes do specifically Pawnee designs? Was it? Well, I know you sometimes. All the designs were Pawnee designs because I made them. They were my creation, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but they weren't traditional mm-hmm. because I. Uh, I don't know of any specific designs or patterns that they had. I've seen earrings that were made by men, but they were pretty plain and they were small, about two pieces, and some had fringes on them. And that's the one thing I couldn't do was fringes. I couldn't cut them that small. And so I had to give up fringes. Mm. <laughs> Took too long. So all the patterns that I made were just uh, a lot of birds mm. in circles. And sometimes the moon with the water bird. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of, I did a lot of peyote work. Mm. Um, sunbursts. I did a lot of those, and, and a large sunburst with the water bird hanging. Mm-hmm. Just different ways of doing things, you know. Combining different, yeah. Yeah. Anything that come to mind, and it always ended up good. You know, it always turned out good, and it. To me, when I think about something that I wonder how this would be, I'd have pieces laying back there, you know, and I'd just start fooling around with them and I'd make a pattern. Something would come up. Mm. So, a lot of times that was how I got my patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, looking back over your career, what was the kind of fork in the road moment when you decided to go this one way as opposed to... For example, keeping on painting, or... What, when was it? Yeah, what was a kind of fork in the road? Moment. Like what I was doing and decided to do something else? Yeah, when you really took this path. Well, it was after, well, it was when I was working for Cuggy. Uh, I worked for Cuggy for four years. And I wasn't getting any credit. I wanted to have my own stamp on the back. I wanted R.I. on there. And I asked him, uh, why not? And he said, well, the Super House is on there. And I said, but that's not what I want. I want R.I., my stamp. Oh, well, we can't do that. So they left it at Super House. They wouldn't change it. And I, didn't, I really didn't like that. So there was a rift starting, you know, and he was getting tired of my work, I guess, and vice versa, you know, and anyway, I was, that's when I met Ace, and we were going to get married, and I was ready to quit, and one day he came in there and he just told me he was going to terminate me, and uh, I was okay. Because we weren't working too good together, you know. And, but I noticed when I went in that day, I knew this was coming. When I went in that day, I had a, I used to keep all my patterns. He had a copier, a big copier. And whenever I made, I would go in there and copy it. So I'd have a, my, you know, different patterns and I could draw from that. If I wanted to make something like it, I could look at that and do it. So that's the reason why I copied those. And 
the night before, I don't know why I did it, but I took all my good patterns. I took them home with me, and I don't know why, but that next morning was when he said he was, you know, I was terminated. He had to let me go. Things weren't working out. He had a store in uh, Tulsa, and he had one in Sky too, and one in Anadarko, and he had to close one. So he's going to close the one in Tulsa. And anyway, I noticed that morning all my patterns were gone. All the folders were gone, and I knew right then, you know, something's going to happen today. And so he told me that, so which is okay, because I wanted to quit anyway. So we ended good, good friends, former neat uh, nephew in law. <laughs> But that's when you launched into your yeah, own and, work full time. Uh, that's when Ace and I got married. Mm -hmm. And I had been working at home doing, you know, little things. But um, that's, what, that, that's what got him mad because he found out I was working. Mm -hmm. But he thought I was doing it during his hours. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it during my, at home, and I had my own tools, because mm -hmm. I bought them from him at the store. I bought what tool, little tools that I needed, which wasn't very much. I was just making earrings, mm -hmm. and I was making those hair ties. So, anyway, I got married, so that's when we started making the jewelry. Mm -hmm. What would you say has been one of the high points of your career? The high points. I guess when I went out to Philbrook, it was one of them. That painting there, it went on tour, you know, I was telling him. Mm -hmm. And then it took a uh, grand prize and uh, what was the other first place and grand prize at Anadarko oh, okay. one year and somewhere else it it uh, took an award, and I can't remember where. Wow. So it's a bit around. <laughs> what's, what's been one of the low points of your career? It was when my husband died, mm -hmm. when Ace died. Because mm -hmm. I just quit everything then. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do anything. Well, is there anything else you would like to talk about before we look at some of your work? No. I can't. Made a lot of good friends on the circuit, I think. What? You probably made a lot of good friends, artist friends, on the oh, circuit. Oh, yes. All, you know, when we traveled all over, and we met a lot of people. And Ace made a slew of friends. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that, going around, and then, uh, I don't know, it's kind of sad in a way, because every year we go back, somebody would be gone, they had died during the year, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it just, you missed them. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know how many's left, because I'm 82 now, so I don't know. <laughs> How many's lasted? <laughs> well, I know you're hoping to get back in your studio soon. I hope so, as soon as I could get back there. We have great plans. I mean, Donna has great plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to go to the Cherokee Art Festival. Do the Cherokee yeah. Art Festival again. Yeah, for another one. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to pause a minute and look at some of your work. Okay, so we're looking at your painting, The Dr. Dance, that you won Grand Award on at 
Anadarko Indian Fair and toured. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about it? It's, a, it's just beautiful and complex, very complex. It's an old pony ritual ceremony uh, called the Doctor Dance, and they had different dancers, different doctors, and they were um, took their medicine from uh, animals, so they would dance like this animal, whichever one that they were doctors of, the animals helped them. So the ones in the painting are the uh, white horse and the black horse. Mm. The ones in the background are the, the ones that's going to perform. They all, they all sing their songs. And the one in the middle is uh, the blanket. That's the... Uh, uh, altered part, mm -hmm. and the people they sit in the back. The women sit in the back. The men sit in front. And that's just kind of a, uh, oh, I don't know, kind of a childish version of what a mud lodge would look like on, in the center inside. Has four actually. They're bigger than that. This is just kind of a hat. And uh, at the fireplace in the center. That's really neat. Okay, Marlene, you want to tell us again about this painting? Uh, it was uh, painted for the cover of uh, a Quapa Pow book. Okay. And I forgot which year. It's and it's just a. Uh, Two-step. Right. And a piece of flat. Right. Two-dimensional work. That's a traditional Indian artwork. Right. Which they don't do anymore. Really nice. Okay, and these were the hair ties you were telling us about. Kind of initially inspired when you were asked to repair some beaded hair ties. Mm-hmm. They're just beautiful. You can tell they just hang beautifully. Must hang beautifully. And these belong to your niece, Donna. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm getting the pattern. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, sort and of a video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got them all. That almost looks like a little floral. Or See what you're going to put on <laughs> Okay, so now we're looking at one of Marlene's necklaces. It's the waterbird design. Beautiful stone in there. Any special memories associated with this, Donna? I think this is um, one of the Christmas presents I um, got to pick out. Wow. Is that where, is that, where that one was? Probably. Um, <laughs> if I was good... During the year, <laughs> I get to pick out a gift, and I get to pick out my own gift. And she'd always ask me um, every year. She does ask me what I want, and I'll what I want for Christmas. And usually, it's uh, it's some of her work. Uh -huh. and, uh, I've been trying to save all it, and I don't have all of it, but I'd like to have at least one of everything she makes. That's why she's got to get back in there. It. I got mo yeah. <laughs> One of almost, each. almost one of each. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Which she doesn't have her daughters have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is a sore spot. So put together. <laughs> I use this pattern quite a bit. The water bird. When I go to draw a design, I can draw the draw a design and put it on top of the other one, and it it it's exactly the same. That's amazing. Not only the water bird, but different patterns that I've done for so long, all these years, it's just automatic. Your hands remember, exactly. And here we're looking at the hand designs. And I love the texturing pattern work. Mm -hmm. The black one is so pretty. Mm -hmm. so. Two more different earrings. 
So we're looking at another one of your hands, but it's not in German silver. It's in the brass. I forgot to mention I worked in brass too. It's a little harder to work with. It <clears throat> doesn't cut as well as the German silver. Mm. But all in all, it works up about the same. And it's a neat look, yeah. Neat colors. Well, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome.